Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, wow, wow. We are in an incredible, amazing time that you're it's going to blow your mind because it's blown ours completely just Oh, it's just so powerful and so amazing. So we're here to primarily look at the underworld Venus magic. We're going to bring a few other things in that are connected to this time and the underworld Venus magic. And um, so I'm Kaylin Castell. I'm here with Sheridan Simple. We are, uh, we're really super excited about this. <laughs> and, and we have so many people joining us because we are exponentially increasing the power of our intention by doing this. So I just want to invite everyone to um, allow a breath and ideally breathe into your belly. Um, if you behind your microphone want to exhale with a ha sound, that helps to activate the um, vagus nerve and calm and bring us into our parasympathetic nervous system. So I just invite everyone to, um, to do that belly breath and ha breathe out come center, come present, come to be with this amazing magical information oh, that we're about to, send, about to um, uh, share with you. And, uh, and so from, yeah, so with that coming into our center, coming, um, inviting in the circle of grandmothers, everyone's personal grandmother guides, all of the ways that we are being guided and led to be present with this time, uh, this this really remarkable, um, probably unpredictable time that we're in, and uh, and with that, um, we're going to um, give gratitude to the grandmothers and do a grandmother prayer. Mm. So this is um, a grandmother prayer we've been doing for the Venus uh, in Capricorn cycle. For those of you who haven't been with us on that. And uh, this is um, our opportunity to consciously choose to die to who we think we are so we can be reborn to who we truly are. And here's the prayer. And if you wanna put your hand on your belly, on your heart, um, however you want to just help bring yourself even more present during this prayer. Wondrous wise grandmother goddess, Thank you for all the ways you inspire me in experiencing total alchemy and transformation. Here in the womb of creation where I am lovingly held, supported, and safe, I wisely allow myself to face my fears and shadow side. Thank you for helping me transmute all that holds me back from truly knowing and expressing my authentic, divine, wise self. Thank you for supporting me as I embrace feeling all my uncomfortable feelings, including uncertainty, inadequacy, arrogance, self-hatred, negative self-effacement, self-doubt, rage, anger, fury, pain, indignation, violation, self-judgment, and judgment of others. Thank you for assisting me in transmuting these feelings into loving confidence and courage. So I no longer project these fears and feelings onto others. And I am no longer blaming others for what I'm experiencing within myself. Oh, mighty wise inner self, thank you for showing me the precious secrets of empowered surrender. Thank you for guiding me in letting go of everything in the way of successful empowered surrender. While safely in your cosmic womb, I am clearing everything in the way of experiencing divine wisdom and divine love within myself, and I am inspiring others to do the same. It is done, it is so, and I give thanks. Blessed be. Mm, blessed be. Gosh, Kaylin, let's just get better and better and better every time. It's amazing. <laughs> So today what we're going to be covering is an, just a quick overview of this Capricorn Venus cycle. So when the cycle started, Venus was in Capricorn. I know a bunch of you know that, but for anybody new, 
So we're going to give an overview of just this specific Venus cycle. We're going to talk, of course, about Venus in the underworld. We're going to look at the sky magic of all the amazing things that are happening astrologically and astronomically until we come out of the underworld in December. We're going to talk about Sekhmet, the underworld goddess, where I'll talk about underworld plant medicine helpers. We'll do Sekhmet chant, and then we'll do our guided meditation into your own underworld experience. And then we always have time for Q&A and sharing afterwards. Beautiful. So um, we <clears throat> have started this cycle in January of 2022. And I'm trying to get rid of something on my screen here so I can see what I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay, so Venus has spent nine months as of the morning star. She rose as morning star on January 14th of 2022. And then she went into the underworld on September 14th. So, you know, though, I know Sheridan, you got to see her, uh, which can happen uh, that she's actually visible longer than the dates that we come up with. We use a 10 degree orb because often planets within 10 degrees of the sun are not visible, but Venus is extra bright. So sometimes she's visible longer than we can imagine. <laughs> sometimes she disappears a little sooner. So it's just, that's kind of an average time, but we have definitely been in the underworld time now because Venus is super close to the sun. And um, this is the time for releasing all the ways and um, all, all the things that are in the way of us with our um, experiencing our wise, authentic self. And during the morning sky, she passes by the moon or the moon actually passes by her at least eight times. And we did have eight times this time. And this represents the seven chakras. We do a lot of uh, chakra releasing and healing work as the moon is with the each of these gates once a month and it's just a, a magical uh, way to prepare for the underworld time where we go through the um, death experience so mm. yeah. and here's a photo that I took of the morning star venus during this cycle with the moon at the heart chakra time over these this amazing ponderosa pine forest in the coconino forest near flagstaff uh arizona on april 26 of 2022 and i love this one especially because ponderosa is an essential oil that i or a plant a tree that i associate so much with capricorn so this was just perfect for me. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful image too that you got there. Thank you. So then the grandmother goddess or Capricorn goddess Venus dropped into the underworld on September 14th, like Kaylin was saying. Yes, and I got to see her late, a little later than that, but that's a rare, really special thing that happened. So that's why we use that 10 degree orb as like the time when Venus is dropping into the, into the underworld, right? On the other side of the sun, which you can see in this picture, and she'll be there until November 31st. So Venus travels with the sun in the underworld or the cocoon hidden by the light of the sun when we can't see her undergoing an alchemical transformation into her butterfly self. And that's where we are right now. And that's what our class and time today is really about. Yes. But what happens after Venus is done with the underworld is she rises into the evening sky. And technically that is December 1st. However, because Venus is on the other side of the sun, we don't always see her as early as the 10 degrees from the sun. She can be in, or if you have to really look closely because she's in that, you know, as the sun is setting, she's in that band of sort of reddish light uh, on the horizon. I've seen her there sometimes, um, you know, you have to have a low horizon line as well. So you don't always get to see her when uh, she rises up into the evening sky, but we will definitely see her by the first gate that happens on December 24th with when the moon comes by. So she spends about um, nine months as an evening star um, and she has uh, eight, seven or eight conjunctions with the moon. Um, in the chakra gates. Now, the, she sent, spends a little longer time and there can sometimes be other conjunctions, but they may happen when she's retrograde. 
So then she'll go retrograde. She'll go through. Oh, I, I think this is your your part. Uh, <laughs> But um, and then she's going to write, she was going to go through an ascension gate in this class, in this um, cycle, she's going to go through an ascension gate. The eighth gate will be the gate of the soul star chakra and ascension. Mm. <laughs> so the underworld, right? So the underworld is so misunderstood in our current culture, right? We all kind of end up thinking like the dark is bad and the light is good, right? But really it's a cycle of wholeness the yin and the yang that makes the wholeness, right? One constantly turning into the other and then back again, creating the one. So if we're making the dark bad, then aren't we saying the yin is bad? And then this pers perspective perpetuates the idea that feminine, the yin is bad and yang or the masculine is good, right? And none of us want to be doing that. It's not something that we're consciously doing, but it's something that I think is very uh, linked to this underworld uh, misunderstanding, right? So the underworld is a healing dwelling of restoration and rejuvenation and transformation, right? We're being reborn, recreated. It's a place of mending and repairing, release and renewal. So in the Sumerian story of Inanna, who we follow through these chakra gates into the underworld and then back up out of the underworld in the evening star phase, right? Inanna is Venus. Inanna goes to the underworld to mourn the death of the great bull of heaven, right? Of the shifting of the ages, of the matrilineal age shifting into that new age of the patrilineal patriarchal domination, right? So we we go to the underworld to mourn and help bring back the feminine within ourselves and in the world at large. So it takes courage to go into the underworld, to consciously choose to face our shadow, but this is where we discover our power and find our inner superhero, right? When we turn towards what's scary or hard or our grief or those deeper emotions, then we find wholeness and more love for all of ourselves. So when we again, orient ourselves towards the feminine, the dark, we find wholeness because we stop running from important parts of ourselves from discomfort. We find peace in the entirety of our beings and deep self-love is born within the underworld is so powerful and beautiful. Do you yes, have anything you want to add? Something? I just want to say that that is so beautifully said, Sheridan. And uh, it, it, we, when we can get that the, it is there for us and it's not happening as a way to punish us, because sometimes it can feel that way. <laughs> but when we consciously choose to align with it and go into that process of surrender and allowing and letting it be what it is. It's just brilliant. Yeah. Amazing. So I created this slide here just for us to be able to see, right? So this is October 22nd coming right up when Venus and the sun are exactly conjunct. So they're in a straight line between us, um, uh, from for us looking from the earth towards the sun and Venus is exactly on the opposite side. So when we're out in the day and we're looking at the sun, it's easy just to think about it's just the sun there. But actually, if we turn the sun off, Venus is right there, right? So I just wanted us to be able to remember that. With Mercury, Spica, one of the stars is not very far away. So I'm going to bring in the constellations now. Uh, should be bringing in the constellations now. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> oh, there they are. Oh, and then quickly we'll bring in the art with the constellations as well, right? So here we are, Venus in the very tail end of Libra here in the priestess constellation, not far from Spica, which we'll see in some more pictures. The shaft of wheat that the priestess holds or seen as the ear of corn or different ways in different cultures. So remember this picture as we turn the sun back on again, and that's what's all going on behind the sun. So when you're outside looking at the sun, you can tune into Venus there, Venus in the underworld. That's what this means. That's what's happening right now for us. And interestingly, today, the sun is exactly conjunct Spica. 
And so mm. for people who might not know, Spica is the was the star that ancients used to represent Venus when Venus wasn't near and, and that you know wasn't visible in the sky. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, um, so we've got that happening as another feature of what's happening for us as we're doing this today. The, uh, the sun with Spica and the divine feminine. She represents, she's the, the strongest star of the divine feminine. And literally there are cultures that would call them, that had a, a, a sect or a priestess um, way of being that they would call themselves the priestesses of Spica. So that's pretty cool. So um, on October 22nd, just a few days from now, four days from now, was is the time when Venus and the um, sun will be exact, kind of what uh, Sheridan was showing just a moment ago, and it'll be just five degrees from Spica, and any star that, or any planet within five degrees, or six degrees of Spica, Spica is one of the magical stars, the Bohemian stars of the ancient alchemists, it's a time to do high ceremony. It's a time to really tune into that particular energy. And of course, Mercury is getting ready to pass Spica pretty soon um, as well. And so, uh, um, although Mercury will be dropping out of the morning sky and be with the sun, by October 26th, and then it will be with the sun exact on November 8th, and then it will enter the evening sky on November 25th, right before Venus enters the evening sky on December 1st. So Venus, so Venus is going to be greeted by Mercury when it enters into the evening sky, and Mercury represents Ninshabar in the story of Inanna. And so uh, this is one of the things that was would happen is the first person the uh, um, Anana sees coming out of the underworld is Ninshabar, or in this case, it will be Mercury. It doesn't happen in every cycle this way. So this is pretty amazing and pretty cool. Very cool. <laughs> so then just shortly thereafter that exact conjunction of Venus and the sun, we're going to see, we'll have, we are not going to see here in the United States, but in Europe and parts of Asia and Africa, there's a partial solar eclipse. So maybe we won't see it, but we're all part of this energy and vibe, right? So the partial solar eclipse, the Scorpio new moon coming on October 25th at 4 a.m. Pacific time. And this is an image you can see of what this will look like, right? And here is the chart. They're all still in that two degrees of, of Scorpio, right? So they're still all close and tight together with Mercury not far away. And there's Spica, right? So again, just more images of this amazing stuff that's happening for us during this time. And I then, to, oh, sorry, yeah, to, yeah, Sheridan, real quick, if you go back, when you see this, I love how this image is showing the moon and the sun interlocking, the interlocking circles. And that is forming a vesica Pisces, yes. which is a portal and a and a, and you know a magical sort of sacred geometry symbol. And that when we have partial eclipses, well, even when we have total eclipses, it will form a, a vesica Pisces for a while before it becomes total. But anyway, just another feature of the amazing this amazing eclipse thing that's happening uh, at on, on October twenty fifth coming up quick. Yeah, no, thank you. I hadn't even been thinking about that. And that's so true. And that's such a symbol of the feminine with Venus there, the exact conjunction. I mean, it's just like with Spica, right? It's just layers upon layers upon layers. So, okay. And so then here we have the lunar eclipse coming right after, right? So on the 25th, we open the eclipse window with the solar partial solar eclipse. And then we go through until November 8th with the Taurus full moon is the lunar eclipse, right? So you can still see Mercury's there, the sun, Venus close by and opposite on the other side of the chart is the moon making the full moon, right? And here's a photo I took last year of the Sagittarius lunar eclipse on May 26th, just as it was starting to set over these amazing tall mountains near my house. Okay, so the back to the lunar eclipse. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I'm jumping ahead. A total lunar eclipse. So a total lunar eclipse 
is an acceleration of anything we're holding in intention. And of course, the Sun and Venus and Mercury all very close to this eclipse. But on the other side, where the, the Moon's in Taurus, Uranus is there. And uh, it and it's, so it's basically suggesting, Uranus is a change agent, is suggesting that this eclipse is going to accelerate our experience. It accelerates our experience of time. We see a full moon, then the moon starts to get darkened. So we see all the phases of the moon going back to a new moon, and then it starts to lighten up again. We see all the phases coming back to a full moon. This happens within three to five hours from a full moon to a full moon that usually takes 29 and a half days for that to happen. So we can see that what we're experiencing when we can witness a total lunar eclipse, very fun to witness, um, we're seeing this acceleration, but we're also feeling it whether we see it or not. And so what you're holding in intention now with this Venus underworld, with this eclipse, um, it's, it's just, oh, and it's election day. <laughs> with Uranus conjunct the moon and it's a and it's a, an eclipse and so what's going to happen we don't know the thing we know for sure is we don't know for sure what's going to happen but it's there's a definite um, intention for things to accelerate through change and radical revolutionary change when Uranus is present with this so pretty cool thank you Thanks for adding all of that. That's so important <laughs> and so key. And you can see here in this picture, right? This is where the moon, the light is starting to barely return there, right? So yes, thank you, thank you. Okay. So now we have, um, this is on December 1st, and uh, this, this is showing that this is all, you know, we won't see the sun with Antares because the sun is there and so on. Uh, but we, but Venus ideally is far enough away that it'll rise up before the, or I mean set, after the sun sets, Venus will still be in the sky um, and maybe in the, that glow of the, of the sunset. And of course we see how close Mercury is, how Mercury is greeting uh, Venus here and, uh, and how they are actually located above. This is the tail of the scorpion, the, the, this curve of the scorpion is underneath the horizon here, but you know the heart of the scorpion here, and this is the head of the scorpion. Um, also, and I keep forgetting. Thank you for doing that, Sheridan. I keep forgetting my pointer doesn't work when I'm not when I'm not hosting this. <laughs> but anyway, thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. So, uh, so this is an amazing uh, feature of what's happening when Venus is technically coming back into the evening sky there mm. and then um this just shows you the degrees so this is showing how venus is 10 degrees from the sun and of course mercury is even a little further than that so mercury is probably more visible than than maybe even venus but but mercury's less bright so uh if you can see um mercury you'll for sure see venus on that evening yeah mm. can't wait i'm gonna start looking around thanksgiving see <laughs> if i can see it early but <laughs> probably i've got her late on the other side so it's probably asking for a lot but yeah and and usually seeing her later uh i mean seeing her earlier in the evening sky is less likely than seeing her earlier in the morning sky or longer in the morning sky because she's brighter in the morning sky than when she's first going uh, she's still closer to the earth at that time right. anyway um so uh the mars and venus out of bounds oh that's the other thing that's happening in this eclipse window because mars is going out of bounds on october 22nd the day of the exact venus sun conjunction so that uh, what this means when a planet is out of bounds, it's a wild card factor. So you might remember I said Uranus with the moon at the um, at the total lunar eclipse, <laughs> which is a wild card factor. And we add this as another wild card factor uh, of, of Mars going outside the boundaries of the sun. So it's not held within ordinary reality. Uh, so this is just like, whoa, are we in for a wild ride? Probably probably we are so if we think about this it you know tends to create chaos and out of chaos comes order that's what the greeks always thought 
that we needed chaos in order to create a new order, a new way of being, a new way of experiencing our reality. So the it's always intended to help with the evolving new order of the world. And this is, um, it's a great time to consider new ways of perceiving reality. Um, Mars is in Gemini when this happens, and it's going to be out of bounds until May 4th of 2023. So we have this wild card Mars for a long time, and it's also stationing retrograde at the end of October. We'll see that in a moment, which is another whole interesting factor to consider as well. So, um, you know, so what, whatever it is that we, um, I think it's just a great time for us to have our imagination run wild and imagine uh, any ensuing chaos is creating a new reality that is liberating and fun. <laughs> that liberates us from the old restrictions of the past and helps us to move into more fun, playful ways of being, especially with Mars in Gemini. And then, of course, as Venus comes into the evening sky, she's going out of bounds until December 24th when she has her first conjunction with the moon. So we're, we're going to have an out of bounds Venus and an out of bounds Mars happening for a lot of December together. And again, that just sort of magnifies this whole wild card aspect that's taking place. Mm. So go ahead. And for those of you that don't know, or you know the term out of bounds, but don't know exactly what that means, this is what this image up here shows. So the sun has this exact path that it follows throughout the year, where it moves across the um, eastern and or western horizon in your sky, right? So it sets at the June, rises or sets at the June solstice at this certain place, the equinoxes at the due west, due east place, and then at the December solstice on the horizon as well. So it swings. And so when any planet or the moon goes out of bounds, it goes out of the boundaries of where the sun can go. So the sun can never set or rise over here to the left of this point or rise or set to the right of this point. But Mercury and Venus are going to both be doing that. And the moon is doing that now every month as well, which is not something that happens all the time either. So that that's why we're talking about this and bringing this in. So you can just kind of start to understand more about that concept if it's newer to you. That's right. Thank you for that, Sheridan, because I forgot <laughs> that there might be people who didn't know that. And the out of bounds moon, we will probably be talking about more as we're doing, as we're journeying with um, Venus. But part of it is that the moon, the, any planet can only be out of bounds what's in the sign of Sagittarius and Capricorn. And of course, this is the Venus and Capricorn cycle and or Gemini and Cancer. And of course, Mars is going retrograde in Gemini. So that's why it's in uh, going to be out of bounds for such a long time. So this is a rare occurrence. It does not happen that often, especially Mars being uh, out of bounds for um, months. Like not just yeah. weeks, it's months. Like this is doesn't usually happen. It can only happen it maybe when Mars goes retrograde, say in Cancer or Gemini, would we have it happen for this long? Hmm. So cool. I know. <laughs> All right, so this is kind of a summary of some of the things that are going on just to kind of give us this sense of how on October 22nd, we've got that exact Venus um, sun conjunction at 29 Libra. And it will not, it does not do this very often at 29 Libra. It's been like 150 years since we've had a Venus sun conjunction at this point. It just as it's, you know, and it'll start a whole Venus sun conjunction every eight years in Libra. Really powerful um, as well. So it's like this rare thing that we're coming into that we haven't had before. And it's infusing from the sun, the sun is the source of light and life so that Venus can source new ways of doing partnership and relationship, conscious relationship, collaborative relationship, co-creative relationships. Conscious, co-creative and collaborative is our like main words that we use for Libra because that's when it's healthy, that's what it's meant to be. Now, of course, we've lived in a culture that hasn't really supported that women were more owned, you know, that kind of thing that um, so it was almost impossible to have any kind of co-creative. We've had hierarchy. So I feel like this is a moment that is taking us into really 
um, setting an intention, a stronger intention. We've probably already had this intention, but just making sure we're holding that intention of having the ability to have the conscious co-creative relationship with the masculine, whether that's within us or externally. Um, and the masculine can have the conscious co-creative relationship with the feminine, whether that's con um, conscious internally or externally both probably is ideal <laughs> anyway and again mars is going out of bounds that day so that masculine factor is not an ordinary reality and so it's an opportunity for that to actually be the case in a new way that we haven't yet had the opportunity you know maybe haven't had the support and fully experiencing so good um, also on october 22nd saturn is going to station direct and whenever a planet is stationing, it's like a still point. It's an activation point. It's a place where we connect into all possibilities at that still point. It's not, you know, uh, T.S. Eliot's poem on it's neither from nor toward. It's neither here nor there. It's, <laughs> it's in the still point. It's where everything is possible and nothing's happening. Kind of like this sort of magical point. So we've got that happening. And then um, the next day, Venus and the sun enter Scorpio and they're still within um, six degrees of Spica. So we've got that happening as well. We've already talked about the um, October 25th eclipse. Um, November 5, Venus is going to be opposite Uranus and it's very close to that opposition still at, the, uh, at that lunar eclipse, total lunar eclipse. Then on, on November 6th and 7th, we've got Venus square Saturn and then, um, and then we're also in the Sawin cross quarter point. Now I know a lot of people celebrate the cross quarter on November 1st or 2nd, All Saints Day, All Souls Day, the Day of the Dead, all of those things that have been done for years, but the actual literal uh, cross quarter when the sun reaches 15 degrees Scorpio, that's where it's the halfway point between the September equinox and the December solstice. And that is the uh, true astrological cross quarter so we've got that happening and then of course we've got the eclipse and um and uranus is with the moon but it's also square saturn so we you know adding even more to the uh unpredictability of that particular um eclipse moment and um and then of course on november 9th the sun will be exactly opposite retrograde uranus um november 15 and 16 venus is going to trine jupiter and then it will enter Sagittarius. And so um, that, that means from the mid-November until uh, it rises up in the evening sky, it's going to be in Sagittarius. And it'll, and it'll I forget when it enters Capricorn, uh, but I think it's after that point. So anyway, um, and then on November 17th, Mercury will enter Sagittarius. So they're kind of entering around the same time together. On the um, 21st, Mercury and Venus are exactly conjunct. And then um, on November 22nd, the sun enters Sagittarius. There's a new moon on the 23rd in Sagittarius. It's with a star that marks the eye of the scorpion. Um, so what are we seeing? How are we perceiving? What's the new vision that we're having? And also on that day, Jupiter will station direct at 28 Pisces and begin its forward movement back into Aries. Uh, and then on um, November 24th, um, Venus is near the new moon at 10 Sagittarius, aligned with Antares. And then on November 30th, um, Venus is opposite Mars, exact on December 1st for Eastern time zones. So, they, so that they're in the opposite parts of the sky, Mars and Gemini and Venus and Sagittarius. And on December 1st was when we have the technical rising of Venus into the evening sky, and it goes out of bounds until December 24th. And then December 3rd, Neptune is going to station direct, and Venus is going to square Neptune on December 9th. And Venus, oh, December 9th is when Venus returns to Capricorn. Good, I'm glad I put that in there. <laughs> very, very good. And then we'll have the first Venus moon gate on December 24th, where she's retrieving a healthy relationship with her root chakra as she's coming back into the bounds of this reality into the into the in the boundaries of the sun so wow yeah like oh my gosh have anything you want to add to that 
no i just think let's all like take a collective breath it's like so much there's so much going on and if you're newer to us with venus alchemy or the you know all the astrology you don't have to know all these pieces parts or understand all of that right this is just for everyone to have so you just let what sinks in and reaches to you maybe like venus with the sun and the eclipse season and then when venus is going to rise on the out of bounds stuff right like those things like whatever just lands for you just take that and over time you'll understand more and all these pieces parts but just know it's a lot. There's a lot going on. It's a juicy, juicy time with Venus in the underworld right now. (laughs) Yeah. I just want to thank you for saying that Sheridan, because a lot of times people will get caught up in the details. Like I have to know all the details and, you know, keep that. The main thing to keep in mind is what is your heartfelt intent and know that everything that's happening now is designed to help bring that into fruition. So Mm. You know that that if we if we understand that and we stay attuned to that that's the that's really what we need to know yeah beautifully said thank you mm-hmm. all right so <laughs> sekhmet and I, I for many of you you will have seen the video that i sent out yesterday um uh talking about my experiences with sekhmet and thoth uh and what happened for me was i wasn't even thinking about any of this but i was out for a walk and and there was something that was mentioned about the pyramid codes and then suddenly it was like Sekhmet was right here present with me and she's like I am the underworld goddess (laughs) I wear the solar disc on I wear the sun on the top of my head I am Venus with the sun I was like oh my god how did I never really put those two things together before like in in such a visceral kind of like wow sort of way and um, so that and then I started me thinking about all the experiences I've had with Sekhmet over the years and some of these stories. So I, I created a separate video to tell those stories. I highly recommend if you're interested and you want to be uh, uh, activated in these um, energies, it's powerful initiations and things that are talked about. But she really is the divine feminine facilitating death and rebirth. And in her story, she is sent by Ra to restore balance to the earth and she goes crazy doing it, <laughs> according to the way the patriarchy tells the story. I think it might have been told differently before the patriarchy came along, but anyway. Um, so when Venus is with the sun, she is sourcing new ways of life and Sekhmet literally carries that source on her head <laughs> as a crown. Like, oh my gosh. Anyway, so yeah. Amazing. Hmm. And uh, so one of the things that I um, got to experience when I went to Egypt in 1999, and that's part of the story I tell in the video, is um, I went with Nikki Scully and she came to Tucson after we did that um, that journey, which was life changing, of course, amazing. And um, we did this thing where um, she had Sekhmet devour us and take us into her belly and digest us and then then that happened on the first day and then on the second day we got spit out in our new self that was <laughs> was really amazing so um and then after that she wrote this book of Sekhmet transformation in the belly of the goddess and it's in the belly and also we have the story of the belly of the whale um like in Jonah and the whale so there can be in that belly place in that underworld place a, a, a massive transformation that takes place and so Nikki Scully says that Sekhmet is the container, solid yet flexible, that holds you safe while you're being cooked and your demons digested and transformed into the more productive, useful potential. This is an alchemical transformation turning the ordinary, our deeply ingrained unconscious reflective responses, (laughs) into the extraordinary through the power of consciously enlightened choice. The power is within. It is simple process of letting go of our false self, um, sense of self, our false sense of self, and remembering or being reborn to who we truly are. And that's what we're here doing now in this underworld time. And I think on the day of the exact Venus Sun conjunction, October 22nd, is a great time to really tune into Sekhmet and see if she has any messages for you. 
around this. She is a compassionate healer. She's here to help through, she does have the ability to destroy, but through her ability to, uh, to do that, she can open the way to something new, to something that's evolving. That's something that we really um, feel more aligned with in our heart and our being. Mm. So uh, something else that we highly recommend and that I, um, I'm just going to give you a little brief view here. And I spoke about this in the video as well, uh, as uh, just to kind of give people a sense to do a Venus life review. So every eight years, Venus comes back into the same cycle it was eight years prior. And this um, Capricorn cycle that we're in right now began in 1974. Venus rose as morning star in 1974 in the sign of Capricorn. And that really started the um, bringing in this greater consciousness of the grandmothers, the circle of grandmothers. I think it was in maybe 2004 or something, there was a circle of grandmothers that was convened um in the um uh, somewhere in new york where the original Iroquois confederacy was uh brought forth and their their constitution which is modeled after our u.s constitution anyway um so but we've been seeing this grandmother wisdom being more and more brought forth um clarissa clarissa pincoli estes has written books on on the crone reclaiming the crone as has uh Oh God, I can't think of her name right now. Um, Ola Jean Jean Shinoda Bolin. Yes, thank you, and um, and others that have been doing that. So this whole thing about in this cycle, we are here to honor the grandmothers, and so I went back and looked in 1974. I graduated from high school. Um, I went to college and dropped out because <laughs> I hated it. I had to go to an all an all girls school that my grandmother sent me to. Um, then I lived in hell with my father for four months, and I was like, okay, done with that. And just as Venus was in the evening sky, I got to go to Maharishi International University and have a better experience. Then you know, I had my first son born, my second my last son born in this cycle. My mother died in this cycle. I tell the whole story about that in the video. I had this cave of dreams. I was also divorced and I moved and I went to Scotland for the lunar standstill in 2006. And then Peter and I got married on October 22nd of 2006, which was the day the Venus Sun Mars conjunction was most precise. So Mars was with that conjunction at that time. Venus was at 28, the sun was at 29. Um, and we did it on purpose so we could create a new way of doing relationship that was off the old world model of how it had been done up until that point. And our intention was that our marriage and our relationship and our ability to be supportive and uh, experience what it's really like to be in a sacred relationship would grow from that point forward. And it has because we're coming up on our 16 year wedding anniversary. So we're having a Venus return on our anniversary is so exciting. And then in 2014, we started Venus Alchemy, being called by the grandmothers, a whole other story that you may have heard at some point. And, um, and then in 2022 was when we have this, all this going on, <laughs> like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so um, if, you, uh, if, you, if this happens to be your Venus return, you definitely wanna look back, but it doesn't even have to be that it's your Venus return. You might go back and look at those dates and see what significant was happening for you or you can do it for your own Venus return. It's just a really great practice. It is, it's such a powerful thing to do and really just tunes you more and more into your own personal cycles and your own personal cycles with Venus and the divine feminine. It's highly, highly, highly recommended. <laughs> <laughs> you can learn a lot. So um, in 1999, after my mom died and I, I, I go into the longer story of this, in the video, but I got to go to see Sekhmet in her temple. And this is the only place in Karnak is the only place where she's the statue of Sekhmet still exists where it was originally placed. And, um, and then, you know, I had this dream about being initiated in the in this cave. And it was like a um, being I was a, an elder initiation kind of coming into my elder wisdom phase of life at the age of 50 when that has happened. So I, I tell more about that story, but just this is so powerful to work with these mysteries. And I didn't even know all these things that had happened to me 
were like connected to this particular cycle until I started doing the Venus work and started doing my own look back. In fact, it was in 2014, I rec started recognizing like, oh, this Venus cycle has been so significant in my life. So, um, yeah. yeah. Amazing. I totally recommend listening to that video because when Kaylin tells the story about the whole cave of initiation and how it's described and it's like part of the initiation of moving into that wisdom, that grandmother wisdom, the Capricorn wisdom. When I first heard Kaylin tell this story, I had just had my own in menopause, right? These are menopause related things of a dream of walking up to this cave. And as opposed to Sekhmet, who was in Kaylin's dream, mine was a mountain lion. So it was like, I had had the exact same experience just with a little bit of different players in the same kind of like life timings as Kaylin. And then she told this story, like within, I mean, it was like days or maybe like a week later, I heard her say this and I thought, oh my gosh, I just had this like amazing experience, right? So again, it's just more ways to like tune in to the power of the divine feminine as we are moving forward and bringing that energy back onto the world stage in her rightful place. Up high magic. <laughs> yes. So here are some questions to think about this Capricorn Venus goddess in the underworld, right? So what would it take for me to trust the darkness, the stillness, the goddess of the void, right? These are questions that you could bring into your meditation today or ask yourself later or just feel into while you're looking at the sun with Venus right there while we're still in this underworld phase. The second one, what would it take for me to accept and lean into whatever the underworld brings forth for me? What would it take for me to completely feel into my shadow and liberate myself? What would it take for me to know inside I am moving into greater empowerment and expression with every step I take, right? That's, that's the ultimate gift of the underworld is empowerment. Yes. And when we ask questions, the universe will answer them. So when we are asking these questions, and so, you know, start with the one perhaps that speaks most to you, journal with it, meditate with it, as, as Sheridan was um, mentioning, or whatever works for you, but uh, go on a walk and contemplate that question, you know, whatever it is. But when we ask these questions, the universe will always bring us answers. And so we want to know, we want to ask the question from the perspective of getting the answers we want, not like, how have I failed? <laughs> how have I not gotten this right up until now? Because the universe will tell you that too. But if you ask what it would take to be able to trust or to accept or to be um, connected to your shadow and liberated or to, you know, move inside into greater empowerment, then you are... Um, um, going to get answers on how to do that, which is what the whole, that's the whole point of this, asking these questions. So, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, an underworld morning practice, meaning you can do this in the morning <laughs> when you wake up, but you could also do it at any time of the day. But I feel like somehow when we're waking up, we may be a little bit more, um, just kind of conscious and aware. We don't necessarily have to leap out of bed and get going. We can just sit there and uh, lay there and just kind of feel into how we're feeling. So you want to, to keep this simple. Don't make it too complicated. But um, as you're waking up, just feel what your feelings are. You might feel anxious or panicked or scared or mad or hurt or depressed or angry or overwhelmed or weary or drained or exhausted. I find in the underworld, those are sometimes things that come up for me. So... Um, but I also sometimes have experience of feeling really happy and content and joyful. So whatever the feeling, it doesn't matter. Just go with that and, um, and start asking questions or just allow yourself to feel, really feel that. And if you're feeling really good, you want to be grateful. Even if you're not feeling really good, you want to maybe be grateful because it's showing you something that is uh, helping you to understand more about what's going on for you and how you can uh, maybe you need to do more surrendering. Maybe you need to do more releasing. Maybe, you know, there's other things that that, inf that can have information. Um, you, could, you could also just wonder, like, is someone or something irritating you? 
politics, work, family. <laughs> Probably for me, the biggest one that irritates me is politics. So, uh, so I have get the chance to go, huh, look at that. I am being irritated by this. Hmm, what's this up for me? What's up for me with that? What's this reflecting to me? So if you're not sure what feelings to be with, ask your body and what's ready to be felt or is ready to rise from deep within and, uh, and then go with that. And you might notice that you have, um, a recent painful incident or or one from long ago that you are still grieving or seething over and i and sometimes you can be grieving and seething simultaneously so we just want to be honest about that so you want to find a way to feel what you feel um about it and it could just be just laying there for a few minutes and just allowing yourself to be present with the feeling you don't have to necessarily do anything but just be with it um, but you can also, if it helps to do things like journal or dance or move or um, tone, I do a lot of toning, <laughs> screaming, I've done some of that, crying, howling, keening, beating a pillow, I've done some of that myself too, shake your body. And that's um, what we're going to talk about next. So you want to do this one, Sheridan? Sure. So this continues. So if you have time rock or shake your body while still in bed, right? Like start to let it move somehow, some way. Moan, cry, scream, sigh with intent to feel what you feel for as long as needed or as long as you, as you have time to feel it, right? And if you're sleeping with someone else in the bed, you could get up and go to another room and like shake or move or dance or, you know, all these things just so it starts to move and get the energy out in some way. Once you notice the feeling is lessened or vanished altogether, send love and light to the person or the situation, or maybe just yourself, but always, of course, include yourself. There are many layers to grief and pain, so revisit or check in each morning, allowing whatever feelings are there to emerge with the intent to feel them and let them go, right? We're not judging this. We're not shooting this. We're just allowing what is and then like starting to take action to let it move out of us. When the feelings of ease, ask the part of you that knows, right? That inner grandmother knowing via meditation or journaling or self-reflection, what are the best activities and actions to take care of yourself for now? I love this, right? Because this helps us tune into trusting ourselves, trusting our intuition, trusting our own unique individual experience of our lives, right? And I think that is so powerful and so key for all of our healing. Remember what your body wants may change from day to day. You might want to shake one day and you need to like scream another day and another day you just write and write and write or art journal or whatever it is. But again, it's just trust and let your body and your soul and your inner knowing, your inner Venus grandmother help guide you into what you need. And it's such a powerful practice that affects everything in your life this trusting it just grows it's beautiful and it, it's so good to do this anytime but of course especially good to do this when venus is in the underworld when venus is in scorpio when there are underworld factors that are taking place because one of the things i feel is challenging for all of us is we live in a culture that it's like we're not really given permission or even guidance on how to feel these kind of feelings if we if we're angry if we're frustrated if we want to like go kill somebody because they really pissed us off but of course we're not going to do that but that kind of anger and frustration or depression that can also happen so when we give ourselves permission to really feel and to do this kind of a practice um simple easy you don't need anyone to help you with it you can just choose it yourself and this is the perfect time to be doing this yes and you'll see in here on a couple of slides there's some links you'll have access to the slides in a pdf and you could click on these links if you want to dive further into any of the things that we've like talked about where there's these links on these slides okay so plant medicine <clears throat> In our last classes during the Morning Star, we talked about vetiver and spikenard, and I stand by those being uh, still great essences to help you 
help all of us move through the underworld time together. But I'm bringing in a new one today for our time together of black seed oil. It's sometimes called black cumin seed oil, but it's not cumin seeds like you use in cooking. It's different. You can see the seeds here on the right and the beautiful, incredible flower that they come from here on the left. Black seed oil is like, it's it's been famous in the Middle East for millennia, right? So it helps with facing our shadow. Seeds in general help bring us into our true being, brings us into wholeness. It connects us into the Black Madonna. So the Madonna that isn't like the Western Christianized white Madonna that we see, more likely the true Madonna. It's been revered in the Middle East. So the prophet Muhammad that uh, started Islam said it is said to have said it cures everything but death. So black seed oil, I mean, in the Middle East is used for everything under the sun, right? And it's a huge immune support, which is a big part of why it's so helpful and powerful. So this is an amazing essence to use during this underworld time as well. And then here is just as we're coming out of the underworld, starting to talk about the evening star when Venus rises in the evening sky. Here is a picture of the evening star Venus with the moon at the sacral chakra last year on June 11th of 2021 that I took, right? And so this is just to be some like sky inspiration of seeing these moon Venus conjunctions is such a spectacular spiritual experience that just really drops you into that ancestral place of where we were connecting and communing with these energies all the time. Shared in a couple of questions I've, I've seen pop in, and that is um, where can they get this seed oil and how to use it? So I'm wondering if maybe we can post that with the video. Um, sure. Yeah. Yep. yep. I will add that in. You got it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. So we would love to have you join us for the Venus Grandmother Goddess in the Evening Star Journey. We'll do ceremony with the ancient Venus cycle, tune into Venus as the evening star, reclaim your rightful power with each, within each of your chakras, reconnect more into your ancestral ways of living on the earth, journey with our powerful, amazing Venus alchemy community, and support the re-enlivening of the divine feminine back into our world. So... If you're inspired or interested, you're welcome to join us on the Evening Star Journey. And I'll put that link into the email I send out as well. And now we're getting ready to do a journey. But first, we're going to start with a chant to Sekhmet. I love this chant so much. Um, I've done it a lot. And then sometimes I'll go for periods with forgetting it, and then it comes back into my awareness. So um, the, Robert Masters wrote this book, The Goddess Sekhmet, The Ways of the Five Bodies. And he says that chanting these words of power while gazing on an image or images of Sekhmet evoke and call forth the possibility of experiencing an altered state in your physical body while also expanding and altering your mind, your emotional body, and your spiritual body. So here's a there's an image of Sekhmet from one of the temple walls in Egypt here. And this and the chant is Sa Sekem Sahu. Sa is the breath of life. Sekem is the sacred power or life force. And Sahu is the fully realized human being. So um, we're gonna just chant this for a few minutes. You can chant behind your <laughs> behind your microphone, but if you feel like you want to say it out loud, you can unmute yourself. And then this is gonna take us into the journey that Sheridan is gonna take us on. So here we'll just we'll just say it three times at least. Here we'll just do three times. So sa se kem sa hu. Sa se kem sa hu. Sa se kem sa hu. So just start to get comfortable. Just start to feel yourself 
dropping into your body. We've been learning things. We've been in a ceremonial space, but we're also, let's just start dropping into our hearts and feeling into that place. And just breathing, letting your breath carry you further down into your body and ultimately down into the earth where so much of that Capricorn sacred wisdom lives within and on the earth and the ancient trees like the ponderosa pine and the juniper and the mountains and the stones just feel that energy present within you no matter your age we all carry that capricorn wisdom somewhere within in our souls so just breathe into and feel your connection held into the earth and held by that grandmother, sage, crone, deep, ancient wisdom within. And feel Venus traveling behind the sun, wherever the sun is in your view right now. Both of these ancient wisdom beings uniting together in the underworld, helping us to cultivate what we're wanting to let go of, whatever is preventing us from accessing that deep, grandmotherly wisdom within ourselves. Anything we need to let go of that is blocking or preventing us connecting to that energy at large. And feel that grandmother energy within and without coming together in your heart, your heart space. And just let your breath infuse that. Let all this energy we've been talking about that's available to us right now with so many special alignments in the sky and the archetypes and the stars and the planets, let that infuse more of that wisdom within you, within your heart, fueled by your breath. And it may already be coming up for you. Is there anything that is preventing your accessing the full power of that inner sage that you carry within you? Are you noticing any resistance to that truth or that energy? Or is something just bubbling to the surface that you're ready to let go of, to ultimately let die within you so that you can be reborn in that evening star phase 
more empowered, more of your true authentic self, carrying more of that grandmotherly wisdom within, trusting that sage within. What is coming up for you that is wanting to be released? It's no longer serving you, no longer needed, is ready to be released and let go of. While we're in this alchemical transformation time of Venus in the underworld. What is one thing that you could focus on over this next, these next six weeks or so, five and a half weeks until we complete this time in the underworld? And as you breathe and you get clear on that one thing, just let it slowly start to descend out of your body, down, down through your body, through your seat, maybe through your feet, down into the earth. Let the earth take that for composting, transmuting, creating new life with that energy. Just let your breath and your energy just release it. Let it start to go. Let it drop down into the belly of the earth. belly of Sekhmet for transmutation and release. And let Venus with the sun just begin to infuse you with more light from above a deeper connection into your soul, your intuition, your true authentic power of who you really are. And let that fill the spaces of what you have released for composting down into the earth. and trust in this seed that is beginning to grow within you. And this collective transmutation, transformation of all of us here together in this ceremonial journey, whether we're here right now or watching it later, we're all in this collective together. Taking a nice deep breath, letting your shoulders drop, your chest open and just feel more of the empowerment of who you are. And so it is, blessed be. And as you feel ready, 
You can begin to bring your focus back into our group. You are welcome to share your experience, share your intention, ask questions, be silent, whatever <laughs> works for you. And I would say, because we have so many people, people probably need to raise their hand and then we can call on them. Just Perfect. so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And... Mm -hmm. So if you, if you don't know how to raise your hand, there's a um, uh, place at the bottom. <laughs> uh, where is it? In reaction? Yeah. There we yeah. go. We started having some. So okay, great. Yeah. Awesome. Jeffrey, All right. Ariana. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they go into the dot 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 more, and under there, this thing will pop up that says reactions, and you can raise your hand. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So um, I just want to bring to awareness that the Constitution and the Bill of Rights were based on uh, positive aspects of the longhouse system of government in the Haudenosaunee people now also known as Iroquois that were learned by uh, Benjamin Franklin. And so our governmental system was based on the Haudenosaunee and the Iroquois, some people know it as, rather than the other way around. And I, I think, you know, you were just speaking like a lot of things and it came out the other way. So I just wanted to correct that. Not in a negative way towards you, but just how important it is to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was doing a really super condensed version of that. I know, I know. And it's a lot of information to condense. Yes. So I just wanted to like bring it to awareness while we're all together. Thank you, Ariana. And the, the other thought is that, you know, the, when the grandmothers, the circle of grandmothers came together, it was part of a fulfillment of a prophecy that said when the grandmothers return or when the grandmothers are honored, we'll... Oh, 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 I got it. Getting, okay. <laughs> Getting the feedback. Um, yeah, yes. Anyway, yes. That it's like the fulfillment of a prophecy. So uh, that's another cool thing about that. Yes, yes. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Both things, actually. <laughs> okay, signing off. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ariana. And then I think Jeffrey's next. Yeah. Hello. Hey. <laughs> um, well, yeah, amazing, as almost always. And this was uh, not almost, oh, as always, sorry. <laughs> as always, amazing, just amazing. And of course, this is such an incredible time as you laid out. Um, and I'm aware there's probably a lot of people who want to comment uh, a couple of quick things. I haven't been able to participate for a whole variety of reasons and gone through a tremendous um, deep uh, soul, you know, the, 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 uh, dark, the, dark, the dark night of the soul in the last six months, six, seven months since we've spoken last actually Kaylin um, but the thing that I wanted to comment on was that you know Kaylin you and I have had conversations over the, the, the last few years at any rate about a um, doing the grief ritual grief ceremony and there since there may be new pe people who ha don't know me at all I'm you know a classically initiated shaman uh, adopted into the Dakota Lakota way, but have studied with a lot of people, uh, including Martin Prechtel, who is Mayan, and Maladoma Somme, who is Dagra, West Africa. But I finally put that together in the synchronicity of the world, of the universe, because um, I knew it had to be more than a day. It, it really needed at least a weekend um and it's a long story that i'll try to make very short which is everything aligned and i had a week to pull it together 10 days to a week to pull it together it was at the very beginning 
of Venus going into the underworld. So it was, you know, equinox and underworld, so perfect. Um, and everybody spoke about it as being life transformative. Um, it was my first run, but I'm like, okay, this really worked. It was really powerful. And as you were going through all of this stuff, I'm kind of like, wow, if I had the energy and the money, I would do this every week for the next six weeks <laughs> because it just fits this, this energy so powerfully. But <clears throat> um, I don't know what the point of that is other than that, the, that ceremony that, and the way that I was able to put it together and develop it, planting these seeds in this underworld it, you know, where we connected with that dark goddess in a profound way. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I just wanted to share that. And, uh, you know, thank you again. This is always, as always, really, really powerful. And maybe that'll happen in a warm place in the next six weeks. <laughs> so, Oh, my gosh, Jeffrey, I just want to say that because I did that ceremony, we've talked about this, I did that ceremony in 2010 with um, Saban Fusome. It was so life changing. And I just can only imagine how powerful it was with all that you bring to it to be able to to do that. And, uh, and, you know, for us to come together and do grief, a grief process. And I don't know how we could do it online, but I still think there's probably a way that could be, um, it's so it's it, it's more than when you do it by yourself just saying absolutely has to be <clears throat> yeah, it's an important piece and and that was an important piece of trying to establish in a group of half strangers how do you create an intimate uh trusting space for people to go through this powerful um transformative process so you know, and they do it in a, and tribes did it as a tribal coming together right. kind of thing. We lost that. So that's right. why it's important for us to figure out how to come back together and do that. I love this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you're doing around let's, that. Let's talk. Thank you. Yes. All right. You Sign off. <laughs> and I saw Nikki, you had your hand raised and it looked like you got kicked out and then you were able to come back in. So if you want to unmute yourself and speak, please do. But if you're done, don't. Um, yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thanks. Yes. So I'm new to all of this. Um, and I'm just so thankful. I had a reading with Kaylin. I don't know how my solar return, but I've had this vision in this meditation and I couldn't figure out, I've been doing some shaman journeying on my own. And I always have had like the, the Puma beside me or like, um, I had, I've always, when I run, I close my eyes, I see them running beside me. But then this one was like a bejeweled mountain lion. And now I knew who she was. <laughs> and I just want to say thank you. Cause I was like, she just came out of nowhere and I see her and I'm like, that is not a normal cougar. That is not a normal puma. Like, where is that from? And what does that mean? And and she, it's like, it's like a painting in front of my face when I close my eyes. So thank you so much. Um, I'm really interested to dive into this and I, I guess she's calling. Um, and yeah, wow. That was really like, thank you so much. I'm just getting whole body chills as you say that Nikki. Oh my gosh. I'm so delighted that you, you reached out to me and that we got you here and yeah. And that this yeah. is a confirmation for you. So good. And, uh, where you're in Canada, right? Yeah, I'm on the British Columbia on the west coast of Canada. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because we have some other Canadians here too. So maybe um, there's a way we can connect you. I don't know. But but I, yeah. don't know. I think they might be further a different direction anyway. Well, thank you so much. And I love this. And it's definitely calling. And I'm so happy to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing all of that. And then... Um, is there somebody else with their hand? I thought, Ariana, did you re-raise your hand? And I did. <laughs> and um, I was just going to um, follow up with Jeffrey. It's really good, Jeffrey, to hear that you have that initiation. And um, 
experience. And I'm all in favor of us finding a way like Kaylin and Jeffrey and so forth to do. I've also been in that ceremony with Saban Fu several times. And uh, currently another person who's who was also uh, trained with Saban Fu and Maladoma is Michael Mead in the Seattle area and with Mosaic Voices. And he's now adapted, you know, doing some of that work through the Zoom platform because of the COVID scene. And I've participated in his winter solstice ceremony and other ceremonies that he's done online. And it actually, there is the transmission, although nothing is ever gonna replace for me who longs so much for the village, you know, reconnection re and being around the fire together in a room or outside under the stars. But um, in, the other way is that we don't get to connect as far afield as we do with this platform. So I don't know, there's blessings both ways, you know? Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just wanted to bring that up uh, is that, you know, Michael Mead's really uh, been able to convey as much as possible that energetic through Zoom experience as well. So, but let's figure it out, you know, in, in the Venus Alchemy community. Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Yay. All right. Thank you, Ariana. That's awesome to follow up. And uh, it looks like Mary has her hand up. Mary Fullwood. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I am. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, so how often do um, do eclipses occur when Venus is in the underworld? And then how is she getting cooked? Right. Since she's so close to the sun. Um, and then isn't it also extremely rare to have, um, the eclipse season in this Halloween Samhain time? And then how does that play into like the notion of the thinning of the veil? Oh, such mm. great questions. Oh my gosh. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So you may have to repeat some of them again, but I just want okay. to say that, um, the, the eclipse season that we're experiencing now happens about every 19 years connected to the 19 year cycle of the moon. So um, 56 years ago, it's about every 56 years that Venus will come back into the same similar place that it was with the nodes and the eclipse seasons happening around that time. So, um, so those who are 56, <laughs> this is was something that probably happened then, but I'd have to go back and look for sure to make sure, you know, cause it can shift slightly. It may not be exactly exact, but I will say, and I wanted to bring this up is in 2003, we had this eclipse, it, um, the total lunar eclipse in November. I think it was on the 8th of November, 7th or 8th or sometime in there it's at the, at the uh, cross quarter time. Um, so, uh, and I got to be in Costa Rica leading a group. We went up to the top of a mountain to, to witness the eclipse because there was too many clouds at the bottom. So we, we went above the clouds and got to see the eclipse. It was pretty remarkable. And th so that's one of the reasons why I remember this, ex this, that timing because of that happening. And interestingly, then in 2003, there was also a um uh, two trines um i think they were earth and water trines creating a um a star of david and people were calling it the harmonic concordance so oh. some of you may remember that um that time and there was an eclipse that was like happening right with that uh that time so the whole point being that it was a big deal then it's a big deal now too yeah <laughs> yeah and then um, what, what were the other questions I'm so got... how is how is Venus getting okay so how often is Venus in the underworld during an eclipse season if you have any idea about so that? yeah that, that depends because um, we know that it, it was probably 56 years ago to be in this eclipse season okay. but um, but it has it, it's like the, every eight years well let me just put it this way every eight years we'd be in this cycle so that's why we'd go back to 50 you know 56 years ago and the nodes would be kind of kind of aligning up with that 
-hmm. we talked a lot about this in the Gemini cycle because um, Venus was with the North Node several times in that cycle. Um, and it had been 56 years since that had happened. Uh, the, um, the nodal cycle is about every uh, 18 and a half years. And Venus cycle is about every eight years. And it has to be that the, 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 to be in the underworld with the nodes in an eclipse season, it's, it's <laughs> rare. I'm just saying it's rare. So thank you for bringing that up and um, helping us to say that a little bit more clearly that we're just in this amazing, miraculous time because eclipses are powerful activation points as well as Venus in the underworld. At the and so time. is she just like getting radically cooked or like how would you describe <laughs> what's happening to Venus? <laughs> I would say she's getting radically transformed. <laughs> and if that involves being cooked, then maybe that's true too. <laughs> um, okay, and what was the other? Oh, and then isn't it also really rare for the eclipses to be so closely aligned with the Halloween Samhain? The yeah. So again, that about every 19 years that would happen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's and I've, so I've, Part of the um the, the cycle of the moon and the cycle of the uh, nodes coming you know coming back together about every 18 and a half to 19 years and so when the eclipse season is so aligned with the thinning of the veil um do you have any insights into that <laughs> well I, you know the um the celtic people <laughs> felt that the thinning of the veil was a time when they could um do a lot of great divination right um, and see into the next year and they you know they did ceremony around that at the time of the cross quarter which is the time when the veils between the worlds are thinnest and uh so of course having eclipse eclipses covering this time it's like because we could imagine we can see beyond the veil also in an eclipse time because we're not an ordinary reality uh -huh. right? it's in a it's like this different energy i often call it an eclipse cauldron um, um and literally i was doing a ceremony uh with my priestess sisters back in 1999 and a woman came with a little cauldron and put it at the center of our circle mm -hmm. and so we did this whole ceremony and then at the at the end she picked it up and looked at the bottom and it said eclipse on the bottom <laughs> oh my and it was for that big 1999 eclipse we were doing the ceremony and i'm like oh my vision of this being like a cauldron eclipse cauldron is now confirmed because there's literally a cauldron here in the center of our circle with the word eclipse stamped on the bottom of it <laughs> uh -huh. so yeah it is a powerful we could call it a cauldron it is you know and it's it, when the veils between the worlds are already thinnest and we've got all this other stuff venus is in the underworld so she's not in ordinary reality either she's off yeah. the world stage it's a powerful 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 time yeah okay well thank you thank you <laughs> i'll just add i'll stand by that using spike nard during this eclipse season because that is one that like helps you travel between the veils as well so um i see ishtara you have a question or a comment <laughs> yes hi um i'm so happy to be here i don't know if you remember me kaylin yes. uh and first time i'm meeting you uh how do i say sheridan uh i just wanted to yeah share quickly because i'm here in in the sinai peninsula in the land of Sefmet. <laughs> i've been walking through her fires and journey through her initiations and you know being in egypt it's uh, if you have been and living here, it can be very epic in so many ways. Uh, I actually have my North Node is in Scorpio, my South Node is in Taurus. I am Sun and Moon in Capricorn, <laughs> and I have uh, my Venus and my Mars in Aquarius. I'm not really an astrologer, so I don't know. I journey with um, the Venus uh, Alchemy. I think was in 2021, and I feel like for sure I'm gonna journey this time. So I just wanted to share, you know, the Sekhmet fire that I feel is so, I mean, yesterday I found your video, uh, Kaylin, and I was watching, and I was like, oh my God, like that just aligns with the work I've been doing with Sekhmet, how she has been 
you know, this year we've, we've worked a lot with her and the things that have been coming forward and like to learn that, yes, yeah, she's Venus and under, in the underworld. And then being here right now and listening to all of this, it just really feels so epic. So I just want to kind of, um, and then yes, the um, uh, black seeds, how you mentioned and like, literally just yesterday or two days ago i saw it in my country you know the black seed and i looked and i wanted to put in my granola but i've held back for some reason and then i saw the oil yesterday and i wanted to like take it to put it in my body and my face and i'm like no not yet so now i understand why I kind of held back so i'm gonna for sure journey with it and yeah so i just wanted to sprinkle a little bit of the sex mess essence from here from directly from uh from egypt to the field and thank um both of you and everyone that was in the call i so so appreciate your work and it it always humbles me the fact that i came across your work when i was here in egypt and then later i came to learn about your work with sekhma so i know that she was the one who also <laughs> guided me to you so thank you thank you Yes. Oh my gosh, Nicole, thank you. And um, the, uh, there was a thought I was having. Oh, it just left me. Oh, are are you um, are you coming up on age forty six or past age forty six? I am thirty. I'm going to be thirty eight. Oh, thirty eight. Okay, so it's a note. I, I for some reason I thought you were telling me the nodes were reversed from what they are now. Okay, cool. Uh, no, no. I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm as I said. I'm <laughs> much about this. <laughs> I mean, I do a little bit. I've been learning a lot with you and I've been following shamanic astrology. That's what I feel called to journey, but it's not the moment right now for me to dive into that. Um, but I've been kind of researching my own process and then I've been feeling since 2020 this epic, you know, um, shift that has been going on for me. And yes. then I just came to learn through you about the nodes being in, in uh, Scorpio now. Scorpio and Taurus, and that's my south node and north node. Like I don't know how you call that by birth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Got so. it. Okay, I just I just misunderstood you. So yes, I love this because of course my twins are in their nodal return right now. Um, it'll be exact on their birthday. The the oh the it'll complete on their birthday next year. So age thirty seven it starts. Age thirty eight is when it completes. And just for anybody who might be listening, also age 56 is a nodal return and it completes at age 57. Um, 74 to 76 is another nodal return. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so these nodes come back about every 18 and a half years and then the moon comes back every 19 years. So mm -hmm. um, pretty cool. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. For yes. Did you see the... Uh... Levia, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly or not, um, was asking whether it was Sekhmet the Egyptian Venus and or was it Isis? Or I would even like say, was it both? <laughs> yes. Both, right? All the goddesses. Well, right? and there's a lot of in indication from some of the research I've done that Sekhmet preceded Isis. So if Isis was seen as Venus, it was it was that was meaning she probably took over after Sekhmet had been perceived as Venus first. Right. So Sekhmet seems to be the older version, but. Okay, you know. I thought she was associated with the moon, Sekhmet. Sekhmet with the sun, Sekhmet with the sun. Oh. But she wears the sun on her head. And that's right. what happens when Venus is in the underworld. Venus has got, is with the sun. And so Sekhmet has the sun, she's, she's the daughter of Ra. She's the. Okay expression of the sun yeah thank you you're welcome <laughs> some of you are asking you, oh, sorry. Sorry. i just wanted to add that also in my research what i came across that actually fourteen thousand years ago they have found sorry there's a child here um uh, a feel uh, a lioness well they don't know if it's a male or a female i can share that with you Kaylin, if you want to then share with everyone but 14, like they found a statue um, made of clay, I think, um, of a lioness or lion uh, 14,000 years ago. So it seems that our ancestors have been worshipping the sea lion you know, yes. long, long ago. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Thank Beautiful. you.
<laughs> yes, thank you. Um, some of you are asking that came in later if you'll be able to get the recording. Yes, I'll totally send that out at some point later today. And another, some of uh, we're asking when is the Evening Star first class? That's December 18th. We will begin that next journey. So um, I just looked, Eileen, to make sure which I sent to you is correct. So, um, <laughs> yeah. And then I've been like slowly kind of reading through the comments, but I will read afterwards. We can't see them. I can't see them when I share the screen. So just FYI, if you're like commenting, that's why we don't say something at that moment. But I've been reading through and thank you so much. And it's just so awesome to like be in this whole big group with all of you. We're so like grateful to have you all here. It just feels so powerful. Yes, Lace, I see your, I see your real live hand up, not your avatar hand. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just wondering this um this conjunction is this superior or interior because I'm hearing and and, and reading in some of the things um that the superior conjunction is even deeper it's more of a um, transmutation than a transformation than an interior conjunction do you either one of you have anything that, to say about that? That's a great question, Lace. So it's called, a, um, they call it in traditional astrology is superior and inferior. And we don't want to give it, so, yeah, it's, they don't right. want to give it those names. So we call it uh, the interior and exterior conjunction. The exterior conjunction was Venus is on the other side of the sun. It's with the sun longer. In the interior conjunction, Venus is only with the sun for seven to eight days before it's like drops out of the evening sky and reappears in the morning sky within a week uh sometimes quicker <laughs> sometimes a little bit longer but approximately that's the the sumerians and the babylonians were looking at it as about seven or eight days that it was in that part of the so this is exterior, exterior meaning it's we're saying the sun and the venus earth. is out of bounds so venus is between the exterior sun and the in the interior conjunction when it's retrograde when venus is not retrograde it's in the exterior conjunction on the other side of the sun and is there for anywhere from two to three months so, so it's exterior that's also the one that's called superior because it's longer it's a longer time with the sun and that's why the sumerian so really in yeah opportunity they call that the time that, really that, really that anana was in the underworld going through a death process Gotcha. So we're, yeah, being re really cooked, burned away. The old dross burned away. Yes. Yeah, the sun helps helps to do that. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah, that's good. And I think that's helpful for people to know because, and you'll hear the words superior and inferior. Now, it's not that it's better. Yeah. It's, it, we, we kind of get that sense of superior being better and inferior being not as good. So that's why we say interior and exterior rather than giving it a, a, a sense of one, you know, some, it's just a different, when it's in the interior going through a very quick shift, it's metamorphic, we call it the metamorphic underworld. Um, then it's, it's going from one expression to a new expression. It's like going through a whole metamorphosis very fast. And that's not any less important than the other part of it. It's just a different part of it. Right. Thank you. Yay. Good question. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So unless we have anything quick else, I think we're ready to wrap this up. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you, everybody, so much. This has been amazing. Mm. And I feel like our, our coming together at this time has really centered us and grounded us in the importance of this time that, and we can, we can just maintain this collective connection as we, um, as we continue through the underworld. Yes. Thank you all so much. Blessings on the rest of our yes. underworld journey together. Wishing thank you, you all. Love. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. 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 I'll okay. see you in December. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Bye. Bye.